So we're here in Prague, Czech Republic, and we are gathered together, a bunch of Moscow people, and we're gonna do a collective close reading of Robert Creeley's I Know a Man. So I am going to assign some parts. We'll see what happens with that. You'll all be responsible for little sections of it, okay? All right, so Diana, you have, um, as I said to my friend, because I am always talking, you have that. Okay. Beverly, you have John, I said, which was not his name. Good? Justin, you have the darkness surround us. <laughs> Etienne, you have, what can we do against it? Yeah? Dana, you have, or else shall we, and why not, buy a goddamn big car? Good? All right. Ava and Adam, you have, drive, he said, for Christ's sake, look out where you're going. All right. And Jane and Hannah and Jack, you have the title, I Know a Man. It's actually really hard to let that title be doing. <laughs> okay, all right. Diana, as I said to my friend, because I'm always talking, say something about that. Um, some people just never can keep quiet. So he's a talker. He's a talker. When he says, because I'm always talking, what is, it's, what's that another way of saying? Um, chattering. And, and what are they doing? You almost get the feeling they're driving. Yeah, but they're maybe, driving. You, maybe you know that before, only later, because as yes. you start reading, you don't know that they're driving. You don't know, but we do find out that they're driving. They're okay. driving. So as I said to my friend, because I'm always talking, parse that. Um, what kind of language is that? What, let's see, is because I am always talking what he says to his friend? No. That's, no. What's going on in terms of the language? He is talking about his friend. He's not really talking to his friend. So he's reporting, he's reporting later, presumably. Yeah, he's reporting that he was talking to his friend. Mm -hmm. um, but, what, but he says, I, as I said to my friend, and normally what follows as I said to my friend is what? What he said. Dana, say that again. When someone says, when I said to my friend, then you, most of the time you said what you said. So it would be, as I said to my friend, and then you say what it is that you said. Relate. What okay. But instead, he says, as I said to my friend, because I am always talking, it's an odd use of the word because. Help us with that. I'm going to get help from these two characters over here, Hannah and Jack. So look at me, don't look at the poem. As I said to my friend, because I'm always talking. Well, it's an aside. It's, it's an like aside. You get sidetracked. And because? That's a weird use of because. He didn't say to his friend anything because he's always talking. It it, he's suggesting or he's diminishing what he's said, right? He's saying, well, I'm always talking. Yeah, I'm always so talking. Said, it doesn't mean, yeah. And have we gotten what he said to but the friend? Like he has to find a reason to be talking to his friend providing mm -hmm. something else. So back to Diana, as I said to my friend, because I'm always talking, you oh, in general, you're getting the gist, this is just starting this off, you're getting the sense that what kind of conversation is this, what kind of relationship do they have? He's, yeah, he's putting you at ease, basically. Who's he putting at ease? Um, the, the reader. He's saying, oh, I'm just, it's just a chatty poem. It's Nothing important. Okay, great, thank you for that. Okay, Beverly. John, I said, which was not his name. What a strange moment that is. It's like he's giving us a, a fact, a certainty that his companion's name is John. But then... And then he immediately withdraws it. And why is it not... Why is the person's name not John? That was a really bad version of the question. Um, <laughs> John, I said, which was not his name. Why would he tell us that it wasn't his name? What are some of the possibilities? That he can't remember who he was with. Okay, one possibility is he can't remember. Good. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I really like that one. Is there another one? He probably said something about it from his name, John. 
he does, he's telling us, he's saying, well, well, let's call him John. Or that he has another name. Or that he has another name. Maybe it's really Jack. Somebody actually in Mob Pop said, it's Jack Kerouac driving with him. <laughs> and John is not his name. <laughs> I'm not sure it's that specific. Um, so Beverly, back to you. John, I said, which was not his name. More digression? Have we gotten anywhere? So no, far- No, we still don't know what he said to Well, we know speech. one thing. We, we don't know what he said, though. We know one word that he said. John, John. I said. <laughs> so John, the only thing he said so far is John. And, and then even that is useless because it wasn't his name. So, so far we have, as I said to my friend, because I am always talking, John, I said, which was not his name. So nothing has happened so far. By the way, what kind of, uh, let's turn to uh, Etienne just for a second. What kind of, oh, you have academic conversations with your friends, so maybe you're not the right guy, but um, what kind of talk is this? Where does this talk occur in your life, this kind of talk? You mean with the what, side clauses? What is the, yeah, what is that? Do you have a friend who talks like this? Do you, do you ever get in a situation where you talk like this? No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> who, Justin, yes, who I talks do. like this? I am. Very drunk people talk like this. <laughs> drunk um, people keep going. I hope they're not academic. Drunk. I don't they're know. Driving. <laughs> they're, well, they're I, driving. Well, I, I, I see them more. Uh, like, Sam, I need to shoot. Don't <laughs> drink and drive. Okay? If you're watching this video, you never got that idea from us. Go ahead, back to Justin. So they could be extremely drunk and driving, or they could be sitting in a bar talking about getting a car, I think. But that, that, that's because that's what happens when, when you get very drunk. You, you talk rubbish, you have yeah. ridiculous aside, and then a, a curveball comes in, like the darkness surrounds us. Yeah. Um, which oh, that's is, your, in fact, I think that's I, 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 I just see way too much of my life. Because I was dying to get there. <laughs> Tell us about the dark, you know what, wait, let's hold off Sorry, a second. Okay. We're back to the rhetoric. So, as I, somebody, say, as I said to my friend, because I'm always talking, John, I said, well, that wasn't his name. And you want to say, if you're sober, or would like to get to the point, you want to say, Bob, will you stop spinning your wheels? You used the word, the phrase spinning your wheels last night, Hannah over here. So what's good about this? We know what's wrong about someone who talks like this. It just drives you crazy. Will you please get to the point? And what would be Bob Creeley's response? This is the point. What is the point? <laughs> Or there is no point. Or there is no point. Because, Justin, back to Justin, the darkness surrounds us. And what does that mean? God, I don't know. <laughs> it, just, it's, it's, it just it comes out of nowhere. It's like, as I said, when two people get drunk, they stutter, and then one of them will say, what's the meaning of it all? Yeah. Um, and that can be an embarrassing moment. Um, Late in the because morning, you can think, that metaphysical bullshit that we did exactly. last night. Yeah. But it sure seemed serious at the time. Yeah. Is that it? Yeah. Okay. You think you worked it out last night and you didn't. So now, Justin, staying with you. Now let's let's get knowledge we get from later in the poem that they are driving. They're in a car. And now when someone says the darkness surrounds us, what might they mean? And put this slightly in the beat context, right? Because we're, we're studying this in Mod Po as a kind of non-beat, beat poem. And in that context, if we're driving, what is the driving being done in the beat, among the beats, for the beats, with the beats? Well, they, could, they could be in the middle of nowhere geographically. Like They're the driving across, across country. country. And why do the beats drive across country? It's not like Manifest Destiny. Sorry, such an Americanism, but you know, the idea in the United States of its kind of tr transcontinental movement is I get in my car on a train in New York and I arrive at San Francisco and I have claimed the continent. I own the continent. I've driven out American Indians and now I'm like an American and this is, right, like get to California, get the gold or, you know, the Joads getting the jalopy and picking fruit and find, you know, all that stuff, right? But this is different. The beat driving is different. How is it different? You're, I'm asking you a kind of literary historical question. But. Just to get away from civilization, the rules and the regulations. And drive for what sake? 
speed of escape and just to drive just your freedom. Just to go. I mean, I think it was one of the uh, favorite words of Neil Cassidy. Go! Go, man! Go! And he was on speed the whole time, so that sort of you know, made it a little easier. And he drove. Well, on speed. Cassidy was the driver, and he, just, he would drive. Everybody else would sleep, and he would drive. So in the beat context, the darkness around us, in a car, in the beat context... They could be in the middle of Arizona in the desert. Um, but it's also just the darkness in general, like the existential darkness. Of, we don't know where we where we are, what we're doing in the we life. Where we're going. Okay. Right. This is a situation where there's two chattering monkeys, as they said about the beats, right? Two chattering monkeys in a car and they're driving and they don't know where they're going and the darkness surrounds them. It's a dark time. Okay, we're gonna come back to that. That's great. Thank you. Okay, Etienne, what can we do against it? It being what? What's it? Well, it could refer to the darkness. Um, or the fact that they, um, I mean, if we take the darkness as the meaning of um, lack of knowledge or uh, lack of certainty, uh, it could have that metaphorical meaning and he could be referring to that um, in, in that sense. Mm -hmm. That's great. And um, if this is the darkness that surrounds us as we drive across the big United States, what can we do against that? Well, he's basically Literally. saying nothing. We can't do anything about it, and he's putting it in the form of a question. What can we do against it? So let's say this is the topic. So we have some college students here. We'll turn to them, Jack and Hannah. Um, what we used to call midnight bullshit sessions. I don't know if you have those. Anymore. You do, right? right. So the darkness surrounds us. What can we do against it? What's the topic of that? undergraduate bullshit session? I mean, becoming an adult, I suppose. That's one way to deal with it. <laughs> Jack, can you be a little looser than that? I mean, Hannah's being so responsible. Right? We'll grow up and the darkness will fade. Maybe the adults in the room would probably beg to differ. Trying to find meaning out of meaninglessness. Um, what can we do against it? Finding meaning, okay, good. And that is like typically what you want to try to do. And in the context of driving across country, what can we do against it? And almost, I'm just gonna say it almost literally is like, what can we do against the darkness that's beyond the headlights of this car in the middle of the night, driving we don't know where, is we will drive into it. What can we do against the darkness? We drive in there, man. Okay, thank you, Etienne. Or else, Dan, or else shall we and why not? Do you have buy a goddamn big car also? Do you have the big car part too? Okay. Or else shall we and why not buy a goddamn big car? Dana? Um, well, it just gets practical in this moment. And we, the moment before when you start talking about the darkness and the thing that we can do or can't do against it, and then he just says, okay, we'll just buy a goddamn car and we'll drive. So what's the gist of the phrase for else? It's the other option. So it's a different option. Mm -hmm. Okay. So can you generalize about the first option and the second? The well, first option is, the second option is? The first option is just to sit there and talk about... Or drive. Or drive and talk about the darkness. And the other option is to do something or... To do something practical? Um, not really practical buying a car, but... Especially a goddamn big car. A goddamn big car. What and attitude is being represented there about buying big cars? That, like the name and everything, that it doesn't matter. We'll just buy a big car and we'll drive. Because so actually the first option is driving and talking metaphysics mm -hmm. fast. And the second option is buying a car and driving. It actually gas doesn't. Guzzler. So the gas guzzler, are they the same, Dana? Well, there. If we're taking a picture, it looks the same, but it's different. And how is it different? Mm, because in the option of just buying a car, you just there's something like 
Bruce and everything, letting everything go and just buy the car and forget about the dog and everything. Hell, let's buy a car and go. Yeah. So I want to ask anybody in the circle, does buy a goddamn big car represent a sellout to, let's say, 1950s conformity? Or does buy a goddamn big car refer to the kind of thing that a beat would do, which is to get a big old car and just pay $35 for a giant jalopy and just be a beat? Which is it? Does anybody think it's conformity? I think it is. Diana? I think it is. So the op one option is to really have these deep metaphysical conversations, existential conversations. And the other option is to sell out. I see it as a sellout. All right, Dana, anything else we need to know about that? Um, or else shall we and why not? What is shall we? Shall we shall what? Shall we is like a very, I don't know, I, I don't speak English so much, but You seems, speak beautifully. Thank you. But it seems like very like, it's it's like something special. Shall we go for but shall God we for what? dinner? But shall Dana, we? what's the grammar here? Um, what else can we do against the darkness? Or else shall we? This is really subtle. Let's get some help here. Anybody? Well, this shall we buy a big goddamn car, but it's goddamn big car, or it says shall we and why not? Shall we and why not buy a big damn, goddamn car? So it could be shall we buy a car. Is it? Or it could be, could be, this is the great thing about open homes. John, I said, which was not his name, the darkness surrounds it. What can we do against it? Or else shall, shall we? we just shall we even try to do exactly. something against yeah. the darkness? Maybe we should just drive into the darkness. Maybe we should drive over the cliff. Maybe we should just end it all. Because the world sucks. It's dark out there. Right? And that's why we're driving in the first place. So maybe we shouldn't even bother, shall we? And why not? So the, so the hell with it. What? Emerson, yeah. yeah. By the way, somebody, before we go on, somebody say something about said, as I said, S-D, John, I said, S-D, ampersand, he said, S-D, look out where you are going, Y-R. Mm -hmm. Beverly, why, 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 like, why doesn't he spell the words out? It's almost like text messaging, it's really condensed and... People have really spent a lot of time talking about this poem as the first text message. <laughs> But anyway, what, so what, why, why can't he spell out said? What the hell's wrong with him? I think it has something to do with him talking all the time. He doesn't have time to actually be too formal about He's, it. Even though, as we've said, somebody, I can't remember who, said this, it was you, Diana. As I said to my friend, he's not talking to his friend. This is not a present tense poem. This is a poem that's recording a conversation later. But it has about it all of the immediacy, the hurry, and the urgency of that conversation in that car. And so he has found a way to spell words that, he, that are the equivalent of the speed of the saying. Right? So he's simulating that kind of shortcutting speed. And that informality, right? Okay. All right. Or else shall we and why not buy a goddamn big car? Okay. I think... Ava and Adam, you have drive, he said, for Christ's sake, the gathering going. Ava, do you want to say something about this? Yes. I have this feeling that um, it's like the word drive. It's like stop talking now. It's like um, in this part of the poem, something will happen. It's the verb drive. So it's like really... Do not talk about it, just do it. Just just drive yeah, to the nice. darkness. So finally we have action. Yeah. Well, I was wondering if it's significant because I don't know if it's who's saying drive. Uh, who might be saying The drive. subject or John. I kind of thought it was the guy who's talking. Well, if I, got I said drive. to my if I said to my friend, then just taking the poem somewhat literally, this would be the passenger John saying, yo, Bob, let's just, let's just try that first. Okay, so if the person speaking at the end is John, in quotes, what's he saying? 
That's not exactly what I meant. You mean like for Christ's sake, look out where you're going? Yeah, what's, he, what's the gist, of, what's the semantic mean? What's he actually, what's the message he's trying to send to his driver friend? Well, that's the reality check. Yeah, so what's That's the friend that's like, dude, you need to deal with reality. <laughs> right, so, uh, so that's yeah. like the highest level, that's a generalization which I love when we get there, but more, translated more um, basically, what's he said, what's the paraphrase of what he's saying? Um, Paraphrase? Something yeah. so small. Okay. Um. <laughs> right, you say, for Christ's sake, look out where you're going. What's he saying? Watch the road. Watch the road. Yeah. There's a cow in the middle of the road. Or, or not even the cow. He's just saying, like, all this talk about the darkness. You're going to take us, you really want darkness? If you don't start driving, we're gonna, you're going to see plenty of darkness. <laughs> so the gist of that now, again... Adam, I'm sorry, I'm making you repeat, but the gist of that in a larger generalization? This is, yeah, they're driving in the darkness and they can crash, so you need to watch the road. Okay, and so Ava said, um, there's a difference between the talking and the doing. Can you say that again? Yeah, well, like, until this part, poem is just about talking and saying and two friends and nothing really happens and now in the last stanza there is like drive for Christ's sake it doesn't matter the darkness it doesn't matter what you think about it or what will happen next just just drive fantastic so now anybody in the circle before we end by talking about the title what is Creeley's or the speaker's position on this matter. Justin? Yeah, take a, take a shot at it. Is he, is he a pro-John? Like, all this metaphysical, existential talk is ridiculous. We have practical lives to lead. Or is he mocking John for putting the brakes on the existential? holds off on that. He, he, he doesn't say um, whether he's been persuaded by John at the end of the poem. I, the, the speaker who says the darkness surrounds us obviously has worries on his mind that he wants to share with John but, um, and John brings him down to earth and um, maybe he does or he doesn't succeed in doing that but clearly doesn't say, I think. No, he doesn't say. Beverly, what do you think? I think it's really inconclusive, I, I don't know. And do you like the poem because of this? It doesn't really, what do you, how do you respond? Are you a pro-John guy or a pro-driver, Creeley guy? Unfortunately, I think I'm a pro-John guy. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to be alive. <laughs> and how do you feel about all that? I mean, the darkness does surround us, doesn't it? How, how are we doing? Is the, I mean, you might just have to live with it rather than talking about it all the time. Just but you shouldn't, to have to choo it. you shouldn't have to choose between car safety and <laughs> for, for <laughs> looking at existential questions. <laughs> well, that's what's so marvelous about the poem, isn't it? Um, well, there's a, there's, I mean, I was, I was reading, um, I can't go on, I'll go on. Yeah. Yeah. It's darkness, but by, it's by a big goddamn big car. And what about poetry? This poem really introduced so many people to Creeley in this approach. It was really a groundbreaking poem. So what can we say along the lines, we've been talking content, we've been talking story lately about the beat, beat era existentialism and how it's kind of humorous to have all that really great beat talk framed by the passenger who says, if you don't drive, all this is going to be really meaningless. <laughs> and, of course, the driver is going to say, meaningless, that's exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> but there is something about the way this poem is written that seems to tell us where our sentiments might lie. Dana, thoughts? How is this poem written? It's unusual, isn't it? It is. Um... I don't know, at first it seems like the, the person talking is like 
something really big is happening to him, something in his mind is happening, he's thinking of this thought and he's ha he has this line of, of thought that the end of it, he's like, he's very self, uh, con it's like concentrated with himself, it doesn't matter what's the name of the person with him, right. it doesn't matter it's anything. Himself. Yeah, something is happening and, and then he says, this is just darkness and I don't know what to do and then he finds his solution, he, he, he just says, okay, everything's okay, let's just buy a car and drive. And, but the other person, John, he's not having all this experience of, of these, thing, these thoughts and everything. So he's just saying, what are you talking about? Just pick up a rock. The lines are so broken. That's, um, I think it's very confusing because you don't, it's not said in one phrase, as it were. It keeps breaking as though yes. he were interrupting himself mm -hmm. in his mental processes. And basically, he has this, I don't know, super ego that is saying, keep your eye on the ball, keep your eye on the road, be when aware. When you say super ego, you're implying that it's another version of himself. And yes, actually, possibly. Adam might have been implying that before. Yeah. Um, so, how does the way the poem is written suggest where we're going? We being all of us Americans or citizens of the dark time, I guess, is really what he's saying. How does the way the poem is written suggest a possible attitude toward driving forward? Well, after the friend tells him to stop talking, he stops talking, the poem ends. So the poem is framed. It is an open-ended poem that actually kind of takes an easy way out. It has a frame. It's kind of a, it's kind of a, tr not a trick poem, what would we say? Clever, a clever way of taking an open-ended poem and ending. But that open-endedness, which is full of digression, which is the way people really talk, but also the way these kinds of poems are written, suggests that the poem is not driving forward, that the talk is not driving forward, that the talk almost ra would rather not move forward. As Jane said earlier, there, he has nothing to say other than that he wants to say something. Well, there, I think the reason why these ridiculous comments like the darkness surrounds us are so important and significant is because they, they come all at once and then they go away. It's like, it's like this, almost like this epitome. Yeah. Um, and, and then it stops, which is what it does at the end of the poem. Yeah, I mean, you said silly, but I don't, it sounds like you don't think it's silly at all, the darkness surrounds us. I find it, when I hear Creeley read it, I'm devastated. Mm -hmm. Like, I really feel like, he's right, the darkness surrounds us. This is a time of nuclear atomic anxieties. This is a time in which people are driving to get away from stuff. This is a time of relentless conformity, at least in American culture. And the idea of buying a goddamn big car does seem like that's the sellout. Is that what we're doing when we're driving? All right, we're gonna conclude with three attempts at the title, which is <laughs> very difficult. So Jane, Hannah, and Jack. I know a man. Jack, give it a stab, just try it. I know a man, what's, what's going on? Jeez, I don't know. I mean, you mean you don't know a man? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I know a man, as I said to my friend, because I'm always talking John, I said, which was not his name. I know a man. Yeah, I mean, it seems to be referring to John, uh -huh. um, but it's not, I mean, it's not really about John unless John had this big impact on the narrator. Let's do an idiot. I like what you're saying. I'm sure we'll pick up on it. But let's do it idiomatically. I know a man. Just in vernacular, idiomatic speech. I know a man. How would you say that? This is hard. Hannah's thinking, I don't speak oh, like this. Like, I know a guy who can like yeah. take care of your needs. I guess, yeah. I know a guy who can fix that toilet for you. Yeah, I know a guy. <laughs> I know a man. So it's like the beginning of a story. I know somebody. Does that help? It helps a little. He says yes, and he's passing down. <laughs> Anna, I know a man. Okay, well, what I find curious 
about the whole thing <laughs> is that I know a man is, is present. I know someone. And the poem is past tense or recounting a story. Yeah. And I think that maybe that points to like this experience is the thing that he that he knows, that the speaker knows, that the writer knows about this man. Mm. I don't know. If I said I know a man who dot dot dot, what would Creeley, what would the writer, what would the speaker say? I know a man who drove across country with me. Mm -hmm. I know a, I know a man who drove across country with me. I know a man who wouldn't stop talking. <laughs> so, so actually I know a man is either Creeley the poet somewhat gently mocking the speaker who might not be him, or I know a man is spoken by John, who is actually Creeley, right, who's shifting pronouns and having the speaker be a non-Creeley. I know a man, who, all that possible? Well, he also, if it is about John, which I'm not convinced, he doesn't really know him. He, I mean, it's totally he paradoxical. uses the wrong name. I know a man, but I don't know his name. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so what we're going to do is, final words, anybody say anything about this poem. In, in fact, what you can do is also say, if you like it, what do you like about it? Okay, and this is going to be quick now, quick. Diane? I didn't like it. I mean, like I don't it. like the way that he just keeps cutting you off at the end of the sentence. It, it was very troubling to me to, to keep tripping over every, at the end of each line. And then, yes. But what if Bob Creeley was a wonderful man? I knew him. Oh, I knew him. No, I knew that man. Um, what if Bob Creeley <laughs> was sitting in the circle and said, Diane from Switzerland, I'm glad that you're uncomfortable. Yeah, well, then he, he managed to. <laughs> Fair enough. Thank it's you. It's not that I didn't like it. I found it difficult to read because yeah. I kept stumbling. And you heard him read. And what is the voice doing there? It's... Uh, it stumbles less than I did. <laughs> <laughs> but how does that voice sound? Anxious? No, I don't think so. Okay. Beverly, final word. Yeah, I did really like it for the reasons that you didn't like it. <laughs> no, I'm just, I, what I meant is I found it difficult to read. And I thought the form was really interesting, the way he, the very unnatural breaks in it, because he doesn't break on a noun. I don't think it's worth These lines, power. these lines they, are they always break in jam, the but he doesn't read the enjambment. By a jam, enjambment, I mean, Hannah knows this, what can we do against it, right? So what can should follow right one from the other. But he reads the breaks, he reads the lines. And that causes what? What is the effect of that? It's very faltering, it's very jumpy. Faltering, stuttering, and align that now with the poem's content. Well, it's kind of saying that language is in some ways quite inadequate. Or formal language is quite inadequate. What we want to say and, and expressing and things. And therefore, like we actually the never get to say what we want to say because we keep interrupting ourselves because the darkness surrounds us. And what the hell? Why mean anything? I mean, this is real beat, beat philosophy in a way. This is real 50s countercultural philosophy. Like, what, what's the meaning of anything? Why bother? I almost see him like after every line, it's like he's going off the road a little bit. He's totally going off the road. In fact, this poem is influenced by William Carlos Williams' great poem to Elsie, which is a poem about how American culture is driving itself off the road. American culture with its melange of cultures and races and attitudes. And Williams is attracted to Elsie, who represents that melange, and is afraid of her. He's afraid of what will happen to American culture. And the ending of that poem, Hannah, No one to drive the car. No one to adjust. No one to drive the car. It's about a driverless car driving down the New Jersey highway. 
Yeah. Which poem was written first, that one or this one? To Elsie in 1923. Okay. This is written in the 50s. Okay. This is a poem that makes a, a full American metaphor of the car that can't drive straight. In this case, it's the poet who can't talk straight, keeps digressing. So is he basing this on that poem? I think partly. Yeah. It's been said, you know, I'm not the first to say it. But isn't there just like this little brief moment of hope here? <coughs> that one line, why not buy a goddamn big car? I mean, you get the whole, the whole idea is in that line, a comma. You know, it's not broken. It's yeah, like that, there's that's this a, moment and then, and then for a drive. Yeah, that's good, that's exactly right. Drive, he said. Yeah, that's totally right. Okay, Justin, quick final word. Um, I, I really, like I said, I think it's very funny. I think the idea of buying a goddamn big car is just so ironically inadequate to the, the task in hand. That I, it just makes me laugh. Yeah. Um, really and I, and I like it. What, sorry? It's a delightful poem in yeah. a lot of ways. Hey, yeah. Dan, final thought? Yeah, I really like this poem. Um, I mean, I noticed that the whole thing is one sentence, and it's uh, basically a small little story. Um, if we look at the context, I think I ha had the, the impression that they were bank robbers. I mean, now I know that it's the whole uh, beat generation thing, but uh, the, that, the fact it's that... It's a he, getaway car. It's a getaway car, exactly. You can't, you can't mention John's real name. Uh, he should drive faster, and um, yeah, there's, there was just this feeling. If you try to contextualize the poem, you always, I think one always does that automatically. Um, so yeah, I, I was, I, and I also liked how um, there's no, I mean, he stands as, he always interrupts himself, and um, the stanza ends in the middle of the sentence, in the middle of the thought, so. Um, and then, of course, in the last stanza, he gets back on track, back on the road, and hopefully he gets his uh, thoughts, you know, a bit straighter. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to switch over to Jack on this side. Final word, Jack. I liked it. I liked the directionless of, uh, directionlessness of the narrative. Directionlessness. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Cool. Hannah? Um, yeah, I really liked it. It feels very relevant. I feel like that's how I talk to my friends. This is the way language really works, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And how nice it is to be, um, I was going to say a young person, but it really, what I really mean is a, is a modern person. How nice it is when, the, when your art comes to you in a way where the language makes sense rather than talking down to you from some formalistic high tone, right? That's, this is the way language works. And your sentiments about driving across the country and... Oh. <laughs> I want to catch this. Oh. <laughs> I mean, are you, are you on drive? Watch where you're going? I mean, I don't know if I, I'm driving across the country, but definitely having these thoughts and conversations and aimlessness -ness. Yeah, aimlessness. That's, that's what the poem's about. Jane, final word. Um, well, when you played Creeley, or the recording of Creeley, reading it, and you said people laughed, and that could have been nervous the Harvard laughter, but like um, Justin said, I, I keep, there's parts of it that make me laugh too. Not like, ha ha, but like the, you know, What's the word I'm looking for? Self-dramatizing existential existential. Yeah, I don't know about, but I think it's funny that the way his, I, John, or whom, whatever his name is, cuts him off with, why not buy a goddamn big car? Here's the idea. We can get through it. Drive, he said, for Christ's sake. Look You're already me. in a car. Yeah, like, what do you... Wait, why do you want a new car? We're driving somewhere right now, and if you don't stop being this way, I we're not going to get there. Hey, I man. find it, it's like We're not painful. To get it's a painful There's situation. No There's no word, yeah, <laughs> stuck in the dark. We're like a yeah. stone. <laughs> no direction at all. I think that's really what's going on here. <laughs> no, no, really. Okay, Adam, final word. <laughs> this is probably, I don't know, This I was thinking like, the way he reads it, where he sounds so vulnerable, and kind of like, maybe it's kind of affected, because he's saying like, I know a man, maybe he meant like, like a manly man or something. He's just at the end going like, for Christ, just like look out where you're going yeah. and stop all the babble and it's like, you know, and so don't worry about it. So the kind of takes back over like the practical. Yeah, um, or it's one solution. I like that reading of it. Yeah. I've been thinking some of it. I've never quite heard that reading of it. I really like that. It seems, 
Seems so basic, too. I know a man. I know a manly man. He's the guy who tells me to stay on the road, stop being so philosophical. <laughs> wow, interesting. Okay. Uh, Ava. I really like it. And the message for me from this poem is that like talking is good, it's important too as well, but in the end you always have to do something yeah. to get to some action. So that's why I, I love like it. Cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I got that poem like I got the dog, but I think it has a very unique atmosphere. You can really feel it. You can feel the drive. You can feel the darkness. You can see. I mean, it works in that way. Um, so my final, final word is really a meta final word, which is simply that, I mean, I think we proved once again, we just met all of us tonight, most of us, and I think we proved once again that this, if you give yourselves enough time, that this model of going through a difficult poem works and that it's not necessary for Al and his merry band of TAs to do all the close readings, that we could generate videos like this and make them available for every one of the poems, then we're, sorry, forgive the phrase, we're crowdsourcing interpretation, we're really spreading the responsibility of interpretation around the world, and that's one of the things that's possible in a massive open online course that's not possible in a standard classroom, where it's always the same one chattering monkey talking on. And uh, so I think it's really important that when we talk about poems that are this open-ended, we have, we model the possibility of open-ended conversations everywhere about them. So I want to thank you all for